So let's review how quantum computing works. Now quantum mechanics has the potential to really revolutionize how we do computing. So before we go into the details of the basics of quantum computing, we have to first understand how quantum mechanics works, especially how quantum spin works, because that gets applied to quantum computing. Now this requires a lot of work, so I will give a brief and a simplistic overview of the working of quantum mechanics and spin, so that at least we can see how it applies to quantum computing in a nutshell. Now, how does quantum mechanics work? First of all, this is basically a wave theory. So all matter is described by wave function. And what happens is that before measurement, the quantum state, it's in a superposition. And what is a superposition? Superposition means if a quantum state has different choices that it can occupy, it occupies all the choices at the same time. At the same time is the critical thing. Take the example, like suppose this is a coin. It's a quantum coin. So it could be heads or it could be tails. Usually a coin cannot be in a state of heads and tails at the same time. It's either heads or tails. But quantum mechanics is weird, so you can have a superposition. This square root of 2 just means the probability. I don't want to go into how we calculate mathematically the probability, but if you square it, you'll see that it's half. So there is a 50% probability of getting heads or tails. So this is what it represents. So before we do any measurement, the quantum state is in a superposition of available choices. Now this, these are just two choices because it's a coin. The choices could be hundreds. Like if you are looking for where the quantum particle is, you know, it could be here, could be there, could be somewhere. So you'll have more than one choice and then this, this will also change. But let's take the simplest case here. Two states, heads or tails, 50% probability each. So this is before measurement. And then the measurement happens now, in quantum mechanics, measurement is not a bystander process. It disturbs the system. So there is no gentle measurement. So whenever the measurement happens, this superposition collapses and you get a random result. So heads or tails, anything can come up with a 50% probability. That's the most you can say. You cannot predict for sure whether there will be heads or tails. So that's why quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. Now, if you apply the superposition principle to our daily life, you'll get weird uh, answers. I'm sure you must have heard about the Schrodinger's cat, where he exactly created a superposition between cat being dead or alive with a 50% probability. And Irving Schrodinger, which was one, uh, who was one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, he realized that superposition, if applied to classical objects like human beings or cats, would, you know, uh, have an absurd superposition of being dead and alive at the same time. Nevertheless, in quantum mechanics, at the level of the quantum or electron, superposition works brilliantly. And as far as we know, this is what really happens. Okay, so how quantum mechanics works? Before measurement, you have a superposition. You do a measurement, you get a result, which is random. So that's how quantum mechanics works in a nutshell. Now we have to go to quantum spin and apply these principles to the quantum spin. In terms of quantum spin, you see the electron can be spinning around its axis. And the up direction or the Z direction is given by the right hand rule. So if it's spinning this way, the up direction is this way. And if it spins the opposite way, you will have a minus Z or a down vector in the Z direction. This quantum spin is a fundamental property of uh, electron or any other quantum particle. So it's up or down. And the critical thing is that it's fixed. 
So either it's plus half or minus half. You cannot stop the electron. You cannot make it go faster or slower. You'll always get this fixed result. This is like, you know, getting electric charge. So if the electron has electric charge of minus one, you, you can't make it minus two or minus half or anything. It's the fundamental property of the quantum. So this is quantum spin. And next we have to study, how do we add spins? You know, if we have two electrons, how do we add the spin? Let's take these simple states. There are two electrons, they could have these arrows up. So this is simple addition, right? Plus half, plus half, one. So Z direction is plus one. And if they are both are minus or downwards, you will get minus one. This is not difficult to understand. But let's, there are other choices too, right? Up and this is down. That is going to be the critical part. How do we understand it? So one, two states. The other states are So these are the other possibilities, that this one is up, this is down, this is down, this is up. This is not allowed. Why it's not allowed? Quantum mechanics does not make things easy for you. So due to the uncertainty principle and the principle for identical particles, you are not, you cannot be sure that this is electron one and this is electron two, especially if they're closer to each other. You cannot, you know, watch them with a video camera or track them because of uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle of, you know, momentum and position. You are never sure which one is electron one, which one is electron two. They are absolutely identical. That's why you have to make a combination. So you can make two combinations. You will say that electrons one is this, electron two is this, or electron one is this, electron two is this. So, so electron one could be up or down, electron two could be down or up. So plus or minus. Again, the Z component is zero in both cases because you know, the things cancel out. However, the main thing to remember is that this has a total spin of one. And why is that? You see, these are vectors and we have to add them as vectors. So let me just show you how we add them. Both up are easy to add. These two add to give the total spin and that's plus one. Both down add to give minus one. This thing is still adding, but in some other direction. That's why in the Z direction, its component is zero, but in some other direction, its component is one. Here, the vectors are truly opposite. That's why you don't get anything, neither in the z direction nor in any other direction. So these three are called triplet states. This is called a singlet state. The main thing to remember is that in terms of the states, the total number of states are four. So uh, more notation. See quantum mechanics, Matrix notation is also very useful in explaining things. So when we say the Z component is up, in a matrix notation, you can say one zero, right? This is arbitrary. I mean, you could have chosen anything, but one zero is a simple thing to choose and this is why we choose it. And down would be obviously zero and one. This is called a qubit. So we are coming to computing now. Now, if you know anything about computing, you know about bits. A classical bit, all our com computers are based on classical bits, which means zeros and ones. And that's all you need to build a computer. Now, in terms of how many states a bit contains, a classical bit in our computer is one and zero. So it has two pieces of information and this is the number of states it has. The qubit on the other hand has much more states in it because of all these combinations. It's two is to n. 
This is exponential term, which means it will increase. We'll, we'll see. See, take the example of this. Four bits. So n is four. So in terms of classical bits, you will have eight. Two into four is eight. In terms of qubits, two is two n is 16. Now, if you keep on increasing, take n is equal to 100. Classical bit would be 200, but quantum bits, 2 is 200. Now, this is a large number. So, quantum computer has many more states to work with. Now, you could naively say that quantum computers are much more powerful as compared to the classical computer. <coughs> well, things are not easy. First of all, the thing to remember is that these superpositions, they are not ex easily accessible to us because the only thing that we can access is then doing an experiment and getting the results. So when we, when we do the measurement, we only get two results, the spin up or down or both up and up or down and down. So we don't have access to this. That's why classical computers are not inferior to com quantum computers in every way, only in certain type of tasks that quantum computers take the edge. Now, you know, if you know anything about computing, with the bits, you basically form logic gates. These are just switches, right? Yes or no or off and off, on. And, you know, you make circuits and you make hardware and then the software runs on it. That's the basic ingredient of a computer. Now, quantum computer also works on this. The only thing is that you have qubit, which has many more states. And how do we harness the power of this? Is through special algorithms or software that runs on these. And the most famous is the Shor's algorithm. Now, I won't go into the details of Shor's algorithm. It's uh, a complicated thing, but I'll just go give you briefly what it entails. See, Shor's algorithm is used to factorize a number. If this is a number, it's an odd number, obviously it has a unique factors, prime factors that make it 15. This is the basis of our encryption. You see websites and, and um, different credit cards and all the encryption is based on this factorization of prime numbers. Now, this is a simple case. Obviously, if this is trillions and trillions uh, long, then this is impossible to factorize. These are kept secret. That's why if this is a big number, unless you know it, you can't factorize it and you cannot then know the secret passwords. How can quantum computer help? Well, if a classical computer has to solve this problem, you see, there are many choices. Could be this, could be some other number, could be some other number. So it has to keep on doing the calculations till it gets the unique number that will make it 15. A classical computer will take a long time because it will have to go one step after another. So each step it has to do one at a time, that takes a long time to do it. And, and especially it takes millions of years if this is a large number. A quantum computer on the other hand can take a superposition of all these choices at the same time. And that really cuts down on the time needed to factorize these numbers. That's where the quantum computer works. Now it can be a dangerous thing because you know, quantum computers, can really break any password. So why are they not on our desk? The thing is that there are practical problems for the quantum computers to really, um, you know, go and reach our homes. Because the thing is that they have to be isolated. Any environmental noise can make this uh, thing mess up. So they have to be isolated and they have to be really at a temperature close to the absolute zero before uh, they can work. And as far as uh, the power of factoring is concerned, you know, numbers like these have been factorized by quantum computers, 
but they are nowhere near the numbers that are involved in encryption. So we are safe. And there's another uh, way the quantum uh, mechanics can help. It's called quantum cryptography, cryptography, which can actually design um, passwords or exchange of information, which is safer. So if quantum computers can break the password, the quantum cryptography can uh, uh, make it secure again. So if you want to know about more about quantum computing, quantum mechanics, or quantum uh, cryptography, I have written a book uh, about quantum mechanics where I go in more details about all this and the link is in the description of the video. Thank you for listening.